what does pledging allegiance really mean? It's more than just words. It's taking responsibility. It's getting involved in our democracy. I'm Allison Daskal Hausman, and this is The Pledge, a podcast profiling people who have pledged to engage in our democracy. Freedom is not free. If you look at the way the Voting Rights Act has been attacked for so many years now and chipped away at Each generation has to fight for those same rights all over again because they're not permanent. Listen to the pledge, be inspired, and get involved. As someone who is relatively new to activism, I'm inspired by those who've come before me those who have blazed trails by dedicating their lives to end injustice. Leaders like civil rights activist Joyce Latner, who at age 19 helped organize the March on Washington. As a member of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee in the 1950s and 60s, Latner was expelled from Jackson State University in Mississippi for participating in a sit-in. And even though she was an excellent student and knew her civics, she failed Mississippi voter literacy tests three times. Everyone who was Black failed. Welcome to the second episode of the mini bonus season of The Pledge. For this episode, we're going to hear an interview with Joyce Ladner from the podcast Democracy Works out of the McCourtney Institute for Democracy at Penn State. Democracy Works aims to rise above partisan politics and the daily news grind to take a broader look at issues impacting democracy. I hope you find this interview with Joyce Ladner as inspiring as I did. This is Jenna Spinelli here today with Dr. Joyce Ladner. Dr. Ladner, thanks for joining us on Democracy Works. I'm pleased to be here. Um, So we're going to kind of take a a tour today, a trip back through your your time in the civil rights movement, and maybe get your your reflections on some of where things stand today. Um, but going back to the beginning, uh, I know you and your sister Dory got involved in the, the movement very early on when when you were in high school. Um, what was the the kind of catalyst for you? The catalyst for us was Emmett Till, and the the lynching of fourteen year old Emmett Till, and the Delta of Mississippi. So that was the clarion call for my generation of Southern black young people to get involved. And so what, how did, how did that, that make you feel and how did, how did you translate those feelings into your, your actions? I remember feeling very, very, very powerless back then. Uh, I felt that I'd been slapped down um, and sh- into an area kind of abyss where I should be very, very frightened. Um, it was not your garden variety of racism. This went far, far beyond. So um, later, and I had high hopes that they would prosecute the people who were found um, to have been to have lynched him, um, and that was not to be. But I, my real sort of visceral reaction came when I saw the photograph of Emmett Till on the cover of Jet Magazine, where, as you know, his mother refused to allow the funeral directors to do any cosmetic work on his face. And here's a kid who had been uh, dumped into the Tallahatchie River, uh, and he was bloated, and they gouged one of his eyes out, and yet... Mrs. Till, by the way, had to fight to get his body released from the state of Mississippi. They had gone ahead and buried her child. She got there from Chicago. She finally got him back and took him to New- to uh, Chicago uh, for the funeral and, and wake and viewing. And she said she didn't ha- allow him- them to change his- the way he looked when she saw him, she wanted the world, she said, I wanted the world to see what they had done to my baby. And that photograph, in all its grotesque, um, 
made us made me feel that I had to one day do something. I didn't know how, but I knew I had to do it. Later, when I became a member of Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, and just talking to my friends, every one of us had been influenced by that photograph. And I mean, you, you, did you think this could be me? This could be my brothers? This Absolutely. Could be... I thought it could be my brothers. I had um, younger brothers, and I said the same thing could happen to them. And I remember my mother drawing my... My brother was maybe eight years old, so but she kept an eye on them. You had to be close to the house. Um, and that occurred even more so when Mac Charles Parker was lynched in a at Poplarville, Mississippi, when I was um, 15 or 16. And Poplarville was just a few miles from Hattiesburg. Today it would be about 15 minutes on the interstate. Mother kept my brother very close, um, my, all my brothers, but particularly my older brother. She and she and my father. She worried a lot about my father being lynched, and it didn't help that the woman who said she was um, raped by Mac Parker lived in a little town called Petal, which was a part of Hattiesburg where I grew up. And you were also in school when the the Brown v. Board of Education decision came down, right? I was. I was what twelve? Let me see, eleven years old. Let me see. Came out in '54. I was born in '43, so I was eleven. I remember the older people talking about it, and particularly my my great uncle Archie, who had fought in World War One and was very politically aware, and a real race man because he praised the achievements, celebrated the achievements of African Americans. He talked about. He also talked. He talked about the '54 decision, but they also talked about that young preacher over there in Alabama, in Montgomery. And those colored people have not been on those buses for months and Sundays, as they would say. And that's why we should stay off the buses here. Mm -hmm. It was that, I was the child, but I re those conversations resonated with me. I remember them still. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, in terms of, of action or kind of substantive change, did, did you see any changes or were, were any no. uh, integration efforts made in your school? No. What happened in the Deep South was that uh, the southern states, immediately after the, the Brown decision came down, rushed to build new schools for black children. So we got a new school. But in the meantime... The consequences were that they closed, I guess, three schools and bussed all those children to my school, to the big school near my house. I could walk a block to school, and uh, I had friends who got on the bus at 6 o'clock in the morning in order to get there. That was the inequity. But they felt that by building new schools that they could stave off integration. We still got the secondhand books, by the way. They hand me down books after four years in the white school. Then they passed them to us. We never had new books. So I understand that uh, Medgar Evers played a, a key role in in, in you uh, getting involved in the the movement in high school. Um, can you talk about what that was like? Your first impressions and and his influence. Medgar, I met when he came to Hattiesburg when we established Mr. Damer and Clyde Kennard established the Hattiesburg Youth NAACP Youth Council. That was about 1958, so I was about 14, 10th grade or so. But I had met him earlier in those years when they would take us to Jackson to these exciting meetings where I saw all these pe black people in Mississippi who wanted freedom like a little child that I wanted. And I saw high school students who also wanted freedom. And it was the most remarkable thing. What I didn't know at the time was that I saw the police out writing down something, but they were taking writing down the, the tag numbers and making models of cars so the county they were registered to so they could call sheriffs in those towns to make sure that they were punished. People lost their jobs because of that, threatened because of it, homes burned because of it, their attendance. So if you want to talk about democracy, this was certainly a, a failure of any basic protections. I was very close to Medgar when I went to college. My sister and I used to go up the street to his office 
This was Jackson State College. And we were eventually expelled because we organized a demonstration Mega Hitolis mm-hmm. was going to take place. Uh, it told us to keep it quiet. Yeah, and yeah, so, and I actually wanted to ask you about that. So, you know, you being expelled by the, the college for the actions you've taken, it seems in some ways that the pendulum on college campuses might have be swinging in the exact opposite direction now where students on, on some campuses are almost expecting universities to step in and, and protect them from ideas they, they don't right. agree with or they, they make them feel uncomfortable as from, from your background and also your, your career in, in higher education. What, what do you make of this? Well, it was very different then because we knew that the state-supported colleges, public colleges, were not going to uh, tolerate uh, protests and so on because they were strictly under the thumb of, of the governor, the state legislature. <clears throat> who were, you know, opposed to desegregation. Um, But the terrible thing that happened to us was that uh, students at nearby Tougaloo College staged the first sit-in in Mississippi at the public library. That evening, we had a protest, a sympathy prayer meeting, actually, the most benign thing one could do in front of the public, in front of the university college library. Emmett Burns, who was a a student but also a minister in training, was in the middle of his prayer, literally in the middle of his prayer, when we heard this voice shouting like, what are you doing? Stop this. Break it up. And we turned and we saw that it was the college president, Jacob Reddix, who came with his arms flailing, and he was just literally out of control. He didn't know what to do. He came upon my two roommates and me. And he grabbed my roommate Eunice by the shoulder and knocked her to the ground. Then sent her to sent the dean over to the dorm that night to tell her she was expelled and had to be out by daybreak. Those were the atrocious kinds of things that happened back then. So in my in that era, we had to force the university to take a take a stand on behalf of us, um, and we fought them vigorously. Um, when they didn't, and frequently it was they did not, as evidenced by the protests all over the country. One last question here, kind of about s- schooling. Um, we talk a lot in conversations about democracy about the, the decline of civics education and oh, that being a problem today. I'm wondering what what your civics education was like, and and what what you think is is missing from from how these these things are being taught today. We. Um, took high school history and social science, civics, uh, ostensibly to become good citizens in a state where we were not allowed, we were second class. <laughs> um, but we were informed, um, provided us with a knowledge base and also certain kinds of ethics and values about what democracy was about, American democracy, even if we had none in Mississippi. I think that one of the worst things that's happened in, in subsequent years is the decline of, of civics education and of a lot of so, social science type courses. Um, the social sciences have suffered tremendously. Um, and, and, you know, just as music is not taught in schools, I mean, just a number of the courses that would make one a round, well rounded person. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So, so, how did you how did you reconcile those things? Kind of learning about these ethics and these values, but yet knowing that in some ways, as you said, they they didn't apply no. to you. Well, my sister was one who argued a lot. She she would argue in in uh, history class that uh, we're not citizens, and the Thirteenth and Fourteenth Amendment to amendments to the Constitution. Um, the intent has not been realized because we remain second-class citizens. Um, and the professor didn't argue back, I mean, because he, his name was Mr. Fowler, Willie Flat Fowler. He was constrained by the fact that he couldn't come out sounding like a rabbit radical in class. Um, so he walked a tightrope. 
we're seeing all kinds of movements today. And I, one, one in particular I'd, I'd like to get your thoughts on is the Black Lives Matter movement. So uh, how do you view their, their organizing principles and, and how they're, they're approaching things? I think um, Black Lives Matter is to this generation what SNCC was to my generation. The, and I think also that Trayvon Martin was to this generation what Emmett Till was to mine. Mm-hmm. And here you had a case of, obviously, of a young man who was just shot and murdered. And the response to it was a national outpouring of anger. And eventually that anger was channeled by um, young people, both college college students and non-college students, I should say, is the case. In a manner that was very similar, I was transported in time back to when we protested horrible conditions. So... I was so excited, so excited to see. Finally, we have some movement activity. And I was never one to criticize students for not caring because I think people care in different ways, but I think that ever so often there's a catalytic force, a catalytic agent that causes people to erupt. And I also believe in something like the levity of the universe in a way. We can go so far overboard in one area that eventually, you know, in a democratic society, it's not going to stay all like it is now with democracy being under great assault in this administration. There would be some reckoning with it, and it may be with the next election. Mm -hmm. So I I know you were also very much involved in the the March on Washington. Yes. And so I've read that that was very much a a male-dominated movement. So so what, what was your role in it? How did you feel about the kind of gender dynamics that were at play there? When I was 19 years old, uh, the way I came to work on the March on Washington was that A. Philip Randolph and Byrett Rustin, A. Philip Randolph was the principal organizer, the chairman, and Byrett was the um, director of the march. Uh, they put out a call for each civil rights organization to send two people to work on the march. Cortland Cox who was a student at Howard, and, and I went. We were sent by SNCC. So I went to, uh, we organized that march in less than a month. It was done with breakneck speed. I wasn't aware of the gender dynamics because it, most of the, there were few women who had emerged as civil rights leaders, very, very few. I often say that, that when I, I'm asked that question in a critical way, like, why didn't you people do stand up and protest? You can't impose a kind of 2020 uh, perspective onto the way people thought about things back then. Dorothy Heith, head of the National Council of Negro Women, was one, and Anna Arnold Hedgeman were the two women who were involved in the march. They were they would come around to our office up in Harlem. So I wasn't tuned in to, I mean, very few of us were tuned in at that at that level. Um, I wanted to, to talk with you about voter suppression. Uh, oh, yes. <laughs> um, tell me about your, your process to become a registered voter in, in the state of Mississippi. I tried to reg- just vote three times in Hattiesburg. I failed the voter registr- literacy test three times. Uh, it was because uh, Theron Lynn, who was the county regist- forest county registrar, failed all black people who came before him, only a handful got through. Uh, at the same time, he hand, he registered all white people. He said he used to take the phone directory and just call people and say, you're now registered to vote. I was required to write essays on two questions. One was an interpretation of a section in the U.S. Constitution. And I know I did well on it. You know, at least I knew what, that, what the Constitution was. And I was to analyze or state the duties of a good citizen. On the third attempt, I knew I was going to flunk anyway, so I wrote that a good citizen is one who obeys just laws and disobeys unjust laws. I mean, I was, at that point, I was just, you know, teed off, and, and so Theron Lynn took, I told, signaled to him, so it was like a counter here, and you stood there, and he had and answered the question while standing, and he was there behind the desk, the, the counter. He took my, I signaled that I'm, I'm finished. He came over and jerked it from my hand and started looking at what I'd written. 
And then he'd look over at me and roll his eyes at me like, how dare she? <laughs> then he called the secretary over to take a look. And as he consulted with her and as he was getting redder and more and more angry, I just waved at him <laughs> like, hi, how's it going? And he, then he came over and told me, well, you failed. And I said, I knew that. And I walked out. What did what what reason, if any, did did he give? Did he make up? Yeah, never gave reasons. He just said you you failed to pass this test. You didn't answer these questions adequately. At least they didn't ask me like they did in a lot of places in the state. How many bubbles are in a bar of soap, or how many grains of sand are in a jar? That's what some people had to go through. Um, And once the other part of the law in some places was that once if you pass that part. the test, then you had to get, oh, your name was published in the in the newspaper. The re- logic was, they said, or the reason was, they said that any registered voter could challenge you for your moral fitness. Oh, <laughs> my these goodness. These people were crazy. They were absolutely insane. I can only imagine what would happen if that was uh, still on the books today or what. what I mean, it, it seems like the, the, the tactics have changed, but in some ways that that same mindset is still there. If you look at how they treated people in in North Carolina, where um, they took uh, absentee ballots to them and and told them they would fill fill out certain parts of them. Um, But you know the real reason they ran people's names in the paper? So that whoever they worked for and other quite powerful fathers in the... uh, white fathers in that community could then, and Ku Klux Klan, they could be attacked. They could uh, lose their jobs. Like it, it was like saying that here's what this man you who works for you is doing, you know? And people did. Some people were beaten, homes burned. I mean, it was, it was atrocious. And the Justice Department eventually, back in, and retroactively registered all those people he had turned down. By then, I was off in graduate school in, 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 at Washington University, St. Louis. So I, I never voted in Mississippi because it, over time I didn't return to live there, although I had planned to when I left, I said. So, um, so I never voted in Mississippi, but I did not vote any place else either until that um, ruling came down from the Justice Department. Was there a, a, a through line or something that, that united all the, the, the different organizing that you did, whether for civil rights or voting rights or, or all of those activities? Well, in the South, the, 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 the phrase we always used was, why are you doing this? And we said freedom. And that, was, um, that remained the case until later people began to say that we were doing this to desegregate. They, they came up with different, different um, uh, mantras in a way. I mean, uh, answers in a way, but we, you know, the freedom songs that we sang, everything was geared toward the concept of, of freedom. Equality was later added in, but freedom remained the constant. And and do you feel you got it, or you you you? No, we goal? realized some some uh, achievements, particularly voter voter uh, the voting rights bill in '65 was a major achievement. Because voting, the whole act and process of organizing and of trying to get people to vote, we registered very few voters, very few people. Uh, nevertheless, we kept pressing on because we knew eventually there would be a change in the laws. And the the um, Voting Rights Act was indeed a major achievement. The six, uh, 64 uh, Civil Rights Act was another. But the thing is, I never imagined then that we would be back to square one, almost square one, in so many places with the attack on voting, uh, the changing of laws. I mean, the dirty tricks of changing, sending out notices that voting is going to occur on the 9th of November instead of the the Tuesday, and of um, changing the rules so that you can no longer vote on Sunday, uh, like souls to the polls where people from churches would go en masse on church buses to, to the polls to vote. Just a, a lot of a lot more tricks nowadays than we ever even imagined. We, we didn't have to imagine it because we couldn't vote to start with. What should people 
do knowing you know knowing what you do every everything you've you've been through what what advice would you have to say young people or, or, or anyone who wants to get involved in in, in organizing and, and trying to to impact some of what they perceive to be injustices going on around them. Uh, freedom is not free um, and we had that elusive freedom in some areas for uh, called elusive for a while um, but if you look at the way the Voting Rights Act has been attacked um, for so many years now and chipped away at um, each generation has to fight for those same rights all over again because they're not permanent. We're going to end, as we always do, with our four Mood of the Nation poll questions. So thinking specifically about American politics, what makes you angry? It's righteous indignation I have now um, toward these Republicans in Congress who are willing to subjugate democracy, the Constitution, defy the Constitution by voting, for example, to fund uh, uh, Trump's wall of them going along with, of them allowing their party, the Republican Party, to be reshaped by a charlatan from, from New York who was never successful before now. I am just absolutely angry over, over the way people have abdicated their responsibilities in Congress. Absolutely angry. Um, and uh, what makes you proud? Of the young people who are standing up proudly, and Black Lives Matter and all other organizations, whether, whether it's a little girl who um, sat in front of the UN each day, you have to remind me of what she was <laughs> there for, but she was protesting and, and um, she drew a lot of attention to a cause. But what I'm saying is that there are so many young people today who in their own way and on their own issues are standing up. What I'm proud of, if I look back, is that the civil rights movement gave rise to the women's movement, gave rise to great panthers, uh, senior citizens protesting conditions, um, and a host of other organizations began to organize and understood that they could practice democracy with a small d. Yeah. That, that I will forever remain, uh, be proud of. And uh, what makes you worry? Oh, I worry terribly about the future for young people um, who will not be as prosperous in many cases as their parents. I worry about, in that regard, I worry about my son and grandson. And I wonder what the future holds for these younger generations who are coming up at a time when their futures are being mortgaged by irresponsible Congress people by adding to this tremendous deficit by um, having them pay in future years for these fat cats to have been given tax cuts at the expense of their future. And then finally, what gives you hope? Oh, I'm an eternal optimist. I believe in the goodness of each human being. I believe it's there. It's a matter of tapping it to bring it out. Well, hopefully listening to uh, our conversation today, some of your insights, we'll, we'll tap some of that feeling to, to come out on our listeners. So, I think uh, so, and I hope so. Great. Um, Dr. Ladner, thank you so much for joining us. I've enjoyed being here. You've been listening to a special bonus episode of The Pledge. Thank you to the podcast, Democracy Works, and to Jenna Spinelli for sharing this interview. Next on The Pledge, we're hitting the streets and asking... What's your pledge? My pledge would be to make the most fact-based, objective decision that I can make in light of the current evidence in the moment. My pledge is to find real ways that are making at least a small amount of change. I pledge to carry on the work. I pledge to not give up. What's your pledge? That's right, I'm asking you. Will you share it with me? You can send me an email at thepledgepodcast at gmail.com or post on the Pledge's Facebook page. You can even send it in a tweet, at Pledge Podcast. Please be sure to subscribe to The Pledge wherever you listen to podcasts and share this episode with all your friends. Until next time, stay strong and stick with your pledge.